Wonderful. Well, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. And welcome to the 2023 Fathom Net Workshop. My name is Katie Croft Bell, and I'm the founder and president of the Ocean Discovery League. I'll be your MC for day one of the Fathom Net Workshop. We're so excited to see many people, um, so many people interested in FathomNet here today. We have more than 300 people registered. Um, and right before we started, we were placing bets on how many. So um, we'll actually show up. So we're really excited to see um, so much participation and so much interest in this. So a very, very warm welcome to all of you. Um, before we really dive in, I've got a few housekeeping items. First is that the workshop is being recorded um, and closed captioning has been turned on. So you can um, enable that for yourself at the in the little control bar. Um, we encourage you to turn on your video. It's nice to always see um, friendly faces and, and everyone who's interested, but please keep your microphone muted. Um, use the chat and Q&A for questions and comments. Uh, questions will be answered and curated in both of those functions, so we will keep an eye on those. And tomorrow, there will be ample time for discussion during breakout sessions. Today will be mostly uh, a one-way information um, dump to you via the um, via the live stream, but we are, we'll definitely be monitoring the, the Q&A and the chat. <clears throat> Please use the um, FathomNet agenda as a resource. The link is right there, and I will also put it in the chat. If I can open that, there we go. Um, so that includes names of all of our speakers, content that will be shared, and links to uh, collaborative content, all of the Google Docs slides, GatherTown, everything you should need is there. Um, and next, a few ground rules for participation. Uh, please choose to be present, to be present and engaged, um, hopefully from beginning to end to avoid distractions. Please turn off other devices. And if you need to attend to something else, please turn off your video so we don't distract others. Um, be respectful, inclusive, and open-minded. Uh, listen with an open mind. Assume best intentions. And um, if you disagree with someone, please be critical of the idea and not the person. Um, seek first to understand and then to be understood. So in other words, think before you speak. And uh, speakers, uh, particularly for all of us, this is a reminder to please keep to your time limit um, to be respectful of both the other speakers and also uh, um, all, all of our participants. And in the breakouts tomorrow, also keep in mind that the groups uh, may be large and time will be limited. So please stay on point um, and to ensure that everybody will have the opportunity to participate. Um, and finally, have fun. We are really, really excited about this project and to share it with you and hope that you're excited to be here too. So a little bit of background on FathomNet and how we got here today. Um, five years ago this week, actually, um, I launched the open, I know, can you believe it, Kakani? <laughs> I launched the Open Ocean Initiative at the MIT Media Lab by hosting an event called Here Be Dragons. This was in partnership with the National Geographic Society. We convened 200 explorers, innovators, artists, scientists, storytellers, um, all kinds of different people um, to discuss the uncharted territories that still exist in ocean exploration and discovery. And to identify those gaps, we hosted about 60 speakers, um, mostly from National Geographic, but also from MIT, NOAA many other partners who discussed exploration and discovery, our thriving ocean, platform sensors, big ocean data, storytelling, and ways that we can engage and empower citizen explorers. All the speakers were challenged with a two-part question. First was, what is the biggest challenge in your field that still exists, and what is your dream for solving it? So you can imagine with so many um, different people from so many different places, there were tons of different challenges and dreams presented. Uh, but the one that caught the eye of Kakani Katija was the big ocean data panel, uh, which identified a couple of challenges actually when it comes to ocean data. First is that large amounts of underwater video and imagery are really difficult to access and use. Even if you know what you're looking for and where to find it, it's still really, really hard to access. And second, that observations that are made and recorded, um, especially in real time, are biased by the level and the field of expertise of the observer. 
So one of the dream solutions to these challenges was an online platform to collect underwater video and imagery and all the associated environmental data, both from research and citizen explorers, and to provide the tools to gather annotations and to use those annotations to train machine learning algorithms. And this would allow us to build a library of trained data that anyone can use to apply their, to their underwater video, enabling scientists to make new discoveries, engineers to develop curious robots, and students and really anyone to learn more about the deep sea. So it's really thrilling to be here um, today to see so much progress having been made in the last five years. Um, now, one of our major goals coming out of this event, Here We Dragons, was to come up with concrete fundable projects that could be undertaken to start addressing the challenges that were presented and not just uh, think a bunch of great ideas and then everybody goes home and, and doesn't do anything with them. So to follow this series of talks, participants created teams and developed collaborative projects to deploy new and emerging technologies in the fields that address these gaps in our understanding. Um, and sharing of the ocean. So we called these rapid field deployments. And there were a number of criteria that had to be met. The most important of which was that they needed to move the needle on both better understanding the ocean and connecting people to it. And I guess a third one would be to have a potential impact to broaden the community to a much broader community than just the team's individual research. So the projects had to be innovative, impactful, compelling, and achievable. So in all, there were eight rapid field deployments that were selected for funding, um, one of which was one called Big Ocean, Big Data, which Kakani led, um, which was to begin the creation of an image library that would be publicly accessible for machine learning analysis of underwater images and video. Now, being from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, which has invested in video annotation for more than 30 years, really since its inception, she was uniquely positioned to lead this effort. Um, the project was originally funded by National Geographic, and then the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration and Research augmented the initial award, and it has since been supported by numerous other funders and organizations and has grown <laughs> exponentially since that, that initial grant, which you'll, be, you'll learn about over the course of the next few days. So five years after Here Be Dragons, um, sorry, no, three and a half years after Here Be Dragons, FathomNet publicly launched in September of 2021 and now includes tens of thousands, if not more, um, annotated images, not only from Mbari, but also several other partners, including National Geographic, NOAA, many others, and hopefully yours soon as well. So the team has grown and evolved, and I want to acknowledge the incredible work that the FathomNet team has done, most notably from Mbari, Sea Vision AI, NOAA, uh, Smithsonian, and many others who have been dedicated to the FathomNet effort from the start, as well as all those newer members of the team um, who are representing the enthusiast communities, education, um, so many different applications um, will, are going to be made with, with this effort. So you'll hear from many of these presenters in plenary today, as well as in the breakout sessions tomorrow. So here we are now, five years after the project was initially conceived. And um, while it is launched and it is public, we do want to stress that FathomNet is in its sort of beta phase right now. It's not a final product, although we're getting there. And that is, in fact, why we're here today and focusing on community engagement, because we really want to hear your feedback on all the work we've done to date and how we can and should be moving forward in the future. So over the course of the next two days, we'll be focusing on three main objectives. First is to share the vision, goals, and current status of FathomNet with you, including updates since that beta launch in 2021. Second is to build community around this important resource for oceanography and exploration. And third is to provide an avenue for gathering feedback on FathomNet so that we can work to improve it and to make sure that it is more useful for you and your work. So today you'll have a lot of information thrown at you. We have six presentations about various aspects of FathomNet, and I'm going to put, or maybe could kind of put the agenda in again for those who have joined in the last 10 minutes. Um, so we've got the agenda, which you have access to throughout the day. You have access to notes and slides and, and all the other content. 
Tomorrow will be more focused on breakouts, um, both to dig deeper into some of these topics, depending on um, if you're a marine researcher or a programmer or an enthusiast, and also to provide time for you to talk about your hopes and dreams um, and wishes for FathomNet. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Kakani Katija, who will present a high-level overview of FathomNet, as well as an introduction to the ecosystem resources and generalized use cases. Kakani is a principal engineer and principal investigator at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and leads the Bio Inspiration Lab. Her research is dedicated to developing underwater technologies to better observe biological and physical processes where they happen in the ocean, and she's been fearlessly leading the FathomNet effort since its inception in 2018. So I'll turn it over to you, Kakani. Thanks, Katie, and thanks for the fabulous introduction. Um, there is quite a history with this project, so um, you know I think it's important for everybody to to at least understand the the beginnings. You know, I also want to add that you know, as as Katie had also mentioned, uh, you know, this this problem of processing underwater visual data is is a, is a, an effort that's been ongoing too. I mean, lots of different institutions, but especially in Ambari since its inception. So it's it's been wonderful to um, be able to to work on this problem and also think beyond just Ambari's walls and try to come up with solutions that can help uh, address the needs of a much broader community. And so with that, I wanted to um, kind of go over maybe the the long-term goal. And I, I always like to be inspired by the work that's being done in other areas or in other fields um, that you know we might someday be able to obtain or, or reach. And um, one really great example uh, of this is the Argo uh, float program. And so the different colors here on this map indicates uh, different floats that have been deployed in the ocean. Uh, you can see basically amazing coverage uh, in, in most of the ocean basins. And uh, this program in particular has, you know, really changed or transformed the way that the chemical and physical sensing um, environment uh, communities have, have been able to, you know, uh, be able to observe the ocean system. And what they've also managed to achieve is this really incredible data sharing program. The idea that, you know, when a float comes to the surface, it offloads its information and then that gets shared, you know, um, over the internet widely uh, for anyone to use within a matter of hours. And so how do we get from, you know, this, how do we get to this kind of situation where we have amazing coverage of the ocean, in particular, if we're, we're talking about like biological observations or visual observations. And so I'd like to um, pull up kind of the, the current state of, of our situation for observing uh, marine life, particularly over a long period of time. And I just wanna highlight this paper by Aaron Satterthwaite and a whole bunch of other uh, authors where they you know, pulled all this data that exists either in OBIS and GBIF, you know, a big data aggregation um, databases. And what they were looking for, right, was different data that um, highlights uh, biological observations, at least long duration biological observations. Uh, they, their focus is primarily on the surface. Uh, and what they found was, you know, indicated by either the blue or green colors here, uh, was that on average, um, there's about 7% of surface coverage or surface area that we have uh, coverage for long-term biological observations. So again, keep in mind that that is the surface area of, of this entire vast ocean. Never mind, right, the fact that I like to remind everybody that, you know, the ocean is this massive volume. Uh, and so for those of us who recognize this, this is a Statue of Liberty on the left and uh, on the right is one of Ambari's research vessels, the Rachel Carson. And, you know, the, the upper ocean, right, the lighted surface of uh, the uh, ocean waters is, you know, uh, represented largely by two stacked uh, uh, Statues of Liberty. But then if we're talking about the entire ocean, this is just a diagrammatic representation of the average depth of the ocean, so about 4,000 meters. 
And so this entire region, right, of the ocean, like we have to think beyond just surface observations and start focusing a little bit more on trying to get coverage, right, of the entire volume of the ocean. So that's roughly 97% of the habitable ecosystem or habitable um, volume on this planet. Uh, and depending on who you are, or what kinds of numbers you 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 see, for instance, NOAA has an estimate that you know about twenty less than twenty percent of this volume has been explored. I expect when we're talking about visual systems or collecting image data, uh, that number is going to be much much less than that. Um, on top of that, right, we've got these other challenges where anywhere from thirty to sixty percent of life in the ocean is undescribed. Uh, and there's anywhere, it, it takes on average about 21 years uh, from the time you first observe a, a, a new species to one, one, when it becomes actually described. And so we've, we've got massive gaps in our ability to observe the ocean, never mind our ability to also um, observe and, and describe life that's there. And so I also want to couple that, right? So we've got this paucity, this lack of information, but we're also starting to see this massive explosion in the ways that we can observe, you know, life or uh, features underwater. And, you know, I like to use at least in Bari's experience as like a, a nice little metaphor, let's say for, for the rest of the community in that, you know, we might have started with one or two vehicles to do kind of these kinds of observations or explorations. Like in this case, we started with Ventana, you know, now we're operating three remotely operated vehicles. Uh, but now you move from remotely operated vehicles to autonomous systems, uh, some of which have more than one camera or one visual feed that you're collecting information with. Uh, I like to highlight the, um, the Benthic rover there on the bottom. Lots of people have heard about the Mars rovers, less so that there are rovers uh, in the ocean that are collecting lots of visual data. Um, and then now we have autonomous systems camera landers, et cetera, that just have anywhere from two to six uh, or seven uh, imaging uh, systems. And so we're collecting so much data without a real mechanism or plan for how we process that, right? How do we scale our capabilities to process this information and make it available and useful? And as you know, visual data uh, has a lot of value and a lot of information. So this is an example of a benthic dive using a remotely operated vehicle. And as it's very clear from this footage, you've got lots of different animals, different species. You also have different numbers of them, maybe um, uh, you know, association with different types of topography. And so the challenge is to go from this visual data, right? It's uh, pixel-based information and convert it to something that, you know, researchers or ecologists can then use uh, and then inform, you know, management or, you know, how do you, how do you continue conserving or, or uh, responsibly using these spaces? And so how do we get from visual data like this to actionable data that researchers can then use? And so, right, given the paucity, so given the need of the kinds of uh, observations that uh, we require, plus this explosion of visual data, what we're seeing, right, is just a deluge of information that's, that's you know, hitting us right now. And we have to really think about, you know, addressing this, this challenge or need. And I also want to say that you know, it, it's one thing to have these crude systems, these more expensive systems, uh, but then, you know, longer term, what we're going to be wanting is, is robotic vehicles that are able to, you know, smartly identify or, um, you know, observe phenomena where we need them to. And so we also have to think about, you know, algorithmic developments that will allow us to expand our capabilities beyond just these crude and more expensive systems. And so this is actually part of the reason why I've started thinking a lot about, you know, something like FathomNet. You know, I wanted to um, create algorithms that could be ported onto vehicles that could go out and search for novel life, observe it, track it, say something about their behavior uh, and ecology. And so one of the challenges that we faced was that, you know, using uh, plain Jane uh, computer vision algorithms just wasn't enough. Because as you'll see in this example, even working in the ocean's midwaters, you often come across lots of different animals that can often confuse, you know, the algorithms that you're running. 
And so in this case, the red circles indicate um, objects that we're trying to track as part of our field tests. And then the blue dot indicates the particular target that we're currently autonomously tracking. And a squid, literally in this run, ran into the salp that we were originally tracking. And you'll notice that blue dot has transferred over onto the squid. We've changed the, the vehicle behavior. And then shortly after this interaction, you have that squid, right, being joined by lots of other animals. Um, unfortunately, we were able to continue tracking on the original target, but really we need smarter algorithms to avoid these challenges, be able to distinguish between these uh, different animals. And the needs for developing those kinds of algorithms is similar, right, to the needs of the community when it comes to uh, automating or at least accelerating our capacity for processing visual data. Uh, and so, We've all seen videos like this, right? These tantalizing um, demonstrations of how algorithms like these can, can be used um, in, in, in visual data, right? And so it, what we've often wondered, well, if we have this capacity, if we have this capability to, to process information in terrestrial space, surely we could do that underwater. And so that was really kind of the jumping off point for a lot of us, not just the FathomNet group, but I would say, argue the whole community is whether or not artificial intelligence can be used to address some of these data challenges that we face. Um, and so I first want to kind of give a very, very high level definition of things. So we, we all can agree on some terms. You know, first artificial intelligence is this massive umbrella term that describe you know, really just programs that have the ability to learn and reason like humans, right? Very, very high level, um, broad, broad reaching definition. And then a subset of algorithms within artificial intelligence is known as machine learning. And so these are algorithms that have the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And a subset of that is deep learning. So these are multi-layered neural networks that can adapt and learn from vast amounts of data. And it's actually deep learning algorithms at least seem to look like they have the best potential when it comes to processing visual data. Um, and there's been plenty of examples of this, not only in the terrestrial space or the computer vision space, but also within the ocean science space. And so in order to train though these deep learning algorithms, what's really required, right, is, is data and lots of it, but very particular types of data. Uh, so first, you know, I want to at least high level explain what the differences in data are and how they can be used for this particular application. Uh, so first, you know, you can subdivide data into either unlabeled or labeled data. And so when I say unlabeled data, that means data that really nobody has taken a look at. You don't really know what's in that, that uh, you know, that data box or uh, packet. But then the other data is what we call labeled data. And so labeled data is data that somebody has reviewed, somebody has looked at, and so we know precisely what is in that information. And it's labeled data that is then used to train these deep learning algorithms. Uh, but labeled data means different things to different people. Uh, and I just want to at least uh, set this definition straight um, so that we're using consistent definitions. And so if we were to do a search for um, a jellyfish uh, image within, like, let, let's start with the Ambari's VARS database. Uh, and this is an example of one of the images that it would, be, would return. Um, and it's pretty obvious in this image what the jelly is, right? It's the only object in this image. It's also centered, uh, zoomed right in. So it's pretty clear that there's just this one thing that we're trying to learn that, that um, represents this concept. But if you also look at the other images or other data that are in the database, this is an example of what one of those images would look like. So if you don't actually know what a jellyfish looks like, um, you know, it's hard to tell what are, of all of these objects that are in this frame, which ones correspond to the right concept. And so when we talk about labeled data, we talk about not only adding the name of a particular concept, but also identifying where in the image that animal or that concept is. And in this case, we're using a bounding box to indicate where these localizations live. 
And then on top of that, not only do you need to add this information or, or create these labels for the, the concept that you're interested in, we also need to create labels for other concepts that might be within an image. And so in this case, this is an example of something that's been labeled that can then be used for the subsequent stages of training an algorithm. So you take your labeled data, you train an algorithm, and then you take a subset of that labeled data and you use it for testing and then later evaluation. And so the idea then is you can evaluate how well your algorithm is working. If, if you're not happy with the performance of that algorithm, you can then either add more labeled data or make changes to the architecture that you're using, for example. But once you kind of iterate on that and you have a, an algorithm or model that you're really happy with, that you think the performance is, is, is meeting your requirements, you can then apply that algorithm on your unlabeled data and then generate inference or predictions for what is in it. And so it's at this stage, right, that one could then review the predictions and, and correct and, and, and then continue using this information. And so the challenge that everyone faces with uh, these deep learning algorithms really is the generation of, of labeled data. It's the mat, it's the big bottleneck, the big elephant in the room that nobody likes to talk about. Uh, but that's that's actually what we're trying to tackle here. Um, and so we really took inspiration though from how the computer vision communities have been operating in this space. And there are two um, big data sets, uh, one called ImageNet and one called Coco, that has essentially transformed the computer vision communities and has really pushed forward these uh, algorithmic improvements that we, we now use and rely on. So first, uh, the first one I like to highlight, you know, ImageNet has 15,000, over 15,000 paper citations. Um, I would never be able to publish a paper like that. But both of these databases house incredible quantities of, of data. Um, ImageNet has 14 million images that represent 22,000 different object categories. Microsoft Coco has 330,000 images, but one and a half million object instances and 80 object categories. But the idea is that by aggregating this information and making that available much more broadly, you know, to the computer vision community, but also in our case, the marine science community, we may be able to create this kind of central uh, repository, but also central hub for people to go to and also um, use and test algorithms on. And so that was the idea behind why we wanted to establish FathomNet. The idea that, you know, each one of us, you know, depending on our research labs or research institutions where we conduct work, we are all generating so much uh, information and visual data, but we haven't really created an outlet for all of us to aggregate that information, put it together, and then actually create this kind of central resource for the community. Um, and so what we wanted to do with FathomNet is just that. Uh, this is an idea, as Katie uh, mentioned, you know, founding institutions uh, in Bari, Sea Vision, and Ocean Discovery League. And we've got uh, data contributions from a number of different groups, um, including uh, University of Plymouth, who also submitted data more recently. And the goal here, um, if we can at least put bounds right on, on our goals for FathomNet, is that we would love to create anywhere from 500 to 1,000 images per concept of animalia described in worms. So that's uh, over 200,000 animals. And so that means this would become a massive database for information. And that's okay, we can scale it. But in order for that to happen, we really need community engagement. And um, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so what we've been able to do, you know, we launched uh, FathomNet at, at our website, uh, www.fathomnet.org in September of 2021. So that was a beta launch. And what that means is really, it's just open to the community and we want your feedback and let us know how we can improve uh, with a goal of uh, getting to uh, uh, version 1.0 uh, middle of this year. And I'll talk about the, the process for what that will look like. But I also want to be very clear that, oh, and we, we did uh, publish a paper in scientific reports that describe the database. So if you want more information, you can um, definitely check that out. And I want to make sure that you understand that, you know, in our mind, FathomNet really isn't just a database, but it's an ecosystem of resources that can address a number of needs for the community. 
uh, you know, first and foremost, right, the website can be accessed by an application programming interface or um, API. Uh, on the website, you can very easily explore the data that are currently uh, submitted to FathomNet. Uh, you can see, you know, geographic uh, results for where these uh, labels might be coming from. Uh, you can also look at other metadata, so, you know, depth, time, location, who has made the contribution. All of that information is tracked within the FathomNet database. Uh, we also created a very, very lightweight annotation tool. Um, this is because, you know, a lot of us collect uh, visual data for a particular purpose or particular reason. Like, for instance, I'm really into snot palaces right now, and so I'm probably labeling only data of of larvations, but there could be a jellyfish, or in this case, a tinophore, also in an image. And I don't know what those animals are myself. So being able to create a tool that allows people to augment data currently in the database was really important to us. Um, and then we also have lots of tutorials, uh, either on our, our blog at medium.com, YouTube, or on GitHub. Uh, we'll talk about those resources uh, next. Uh, and then uh, we've created a collection of machine learning models that can be found in our model zoo also on GitHub. Uh, and Eric will be talking about that um, just a bit later. And so really, I think what's important here is that we're trying to leverage widely available open source tools for these kinds of architectures that can then be used by the community. We really just want to open up our capacity beyond, you know, the the, the research, let's say, um, uh, hubs, and 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 include more individuals and become more accessible. Um, and so, I want to say that Fathomnet has many potential uses, uh, and then four key communities that uh, Fathomnet can benefit. Uh, the first are obviously taxonomists um, because it's it's a way that we can provide collaborative a global marine life key that has flexible hierarchies that can also aggregate observations of known and unknown biota. So by creating this, this hub for uh, collaboration, we might be able to help further and, and push forward um, uh, uh, discoveries of, of life that we might not have been able to do before. Obviously, I think we're also targeting programmers, the idea that we can deliver access to a novel data set that can be used to develop and evaluate uh, state-of-the-art uh, computer vision algorithms. Um, this is really, really important because that, you know, that entire field is, is, is transforming constantly. And we would love it uh, to have that kind of level of interest in underwater um, at the vision applications as well. And then also enthusiasts. I think you know, we've, we've spoken with a lot of enthusiasts. In fact, we have um, members of the live stream oceanographic community that have helped us understand that they would like to contribute more. You know, this is the ocean is an important place with lots of interesting um, and I don't know exciting uh, life. And you know, there's ways that we can incorporate uh, their energy and their expertise into this process as well. Uh, and then finally, educators. You know, the fact that we can provide resources and access to ocean visual data for experiential learning opportunities. And so for the purposes of this, uh, this workshop, we're really focusing on the, the first three. Um, taxonomists also includes marine scientists. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, we'd love to hear from you also what you think uh, FathomNet can, can be useful for you. And so back to that question, can artificial intelligence address our data challenges? Uh, we think with labeled databases like FathomNet, the answer is yes. And I just wanted to share with you a couple highlights. Um, for instance, you know, we've uh, Lonnie, uh, who's on here, has has trained um, a Yolo V5 model using data in FathomNet, and then we've run this on um, the, the same visual data that I showed earlier, and you can already see that we're getting pretty great IDs on um, individuals. Um, obviously, we're missing some things. It's not 100% accurate, but this is the process of eventually getting there. Uh, we have to start somewhere. And I should also add that these models are, can be available to download in the FathomNet Model Zoo right now. Um, other applications, right, is that tracking one that I, I mentioned earlier. This is what keeps me up at night is the idea that I, if I want to track a, a jellyfish for 24 hours with an autonomous system, again, not losing that animal so that we can do these long duration observations. And in this case, you could see that, you know, our tracking is not disrupted, even if there's other animals or other objects that come into the field. And then I think what's really exciting is the fact that, you know, we are able to um, get to this point where we can pre-program a vehicle to go out 
and find particular animals that we want to study. In this case, like a, a giant larvation in its snot palace. Uh, in the top left, this you can see the mode of the vehicle. So we're in search now. And then as we get closer to, you know, an object of interest, um, it starts to compare the detections with the, the search class. You can see we transition to acquire and then finally track once we verify that those IDs are, are the right thing. So the idea is that, you know, with these, this, these labeled data that it exists in FathomNet, we can really usher in a whole bunch of new algorithmic developments that can help solve a number of different problems that we're, we're facing in the ocean science community. Uh, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Or not. Going once, going twice. You can always put questions in the chat. Great, we've got a question Janet. from Janet. Oh, we do have a few questions. So we have about eight minutes for questions right now. Perfect. So Janet. Myself. <laughs> um, so I went on FathomNet and I noticed there's a lot of like still imagery. Um, is Are there any videos gonna be put up there? Or? That's a really good question. Um, we are starting with image data first for uh, training or for at least the label data. Um, I know we've been also talking about doing hosting like data challenges and competitions um, where those competitions could involve video data. Uh, but right now we're starting with image data only as part of the FathomNet um, database. Thanks, Janet. We have a couple of questions related to the box and the annotation. One is whether or not the box annotation is sufficient. And another person asked how important that localization is. Right. Um, there's a number of us who can answer that question. But I mean, the first, it depends on your needs. I will say that, you know, Fathomet, the way we built Fathomet is we're starting with box, box annotations. Um, there are some groups, for instance, like the coral community that, that tends to also want to do segmentations or, you know, polygons for, um, for, you know, localizations. That's something that we've been discussing about being able to incorporate that into Fathomet eventually. Uh, but right now we're starting with boxes only. Um, I don't know if Eric, you want to add anything else to that? Um. No, not at not the moment, I don't think. Okay. Great. Um, Andrea asks, what other ways uh, are the identification data being used? Right. So, I mean, we have, so Karen Osborne, who's a, a researcher at the Smithsonian, she'll be uh, talking about um, some of the ways the marine science community might be able to use this data. I mean, what she's really interested in is finding out, you know, who who might be the people who are uploading uh, data of different animals she might be wanting to study. So as a mechanism to find new collaborators, um, also like new potential ranges or observations of animals that, you know, one might not expect to see in, in different locations or different environments. So so that's one way um, the, the, the data are, are potentially being used. Great, thanks. Um, we have a couple of questions related to um, skills required to do this. Um, George asks, so anyone can do this? And Megan asks, what level of programming skill do you need in general for the AI software? Yeah, um, like I said, everything is based on open source software. And there are so many um, resources now online describing how one can do that or use that. Um, we will also, as part of tomorrow's activities, walk you through using, you know, like the FathomNet Python API uh, in, a, in a collab notebook um, so that, you know, we basically lay out how you would use that data. Um, but I mean, Kevin, I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. Yeah, no, I, I'm just going to say that too. We do have that collab notebook. And actually today I'll be um, showing you the beginning portion of that. And tomorrow in the breakout session for the programmers group, we'll go into uh, some examples of 
how you can actually pull down data sets and things like that. Um, I will say though, if you're not, if you don't have a programming background, uh, those notebooks are set up so that it's just point and click. So you can just click through the code and you can see the results and uh, progressively uh, experiment with different things as uh, fits your use case. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, I think that answers a few. There's some more detailed questions on like how exactly somebody would use this. So um, I think the short answer is we're going to get into that um, in more detail throughout today and um, tomorrow. And I do, there is another question about, um, from Paloma about how FathomNet could detect very specific high detailed features of organisms that might be necessary to identify to the species level. Absolutely. And that's, I think, one of the limitations, right, that all, all ecologists are finding with visual data. It's, it's um, you can't get down to species ID uh, for all of your imagery, right? Um, I know, uh, for instance, we were able to do that on Ambari, partly because we've been doing all of this work in Monterey Bay, but especially if you're going to new places, oftentimes you need very zoomed in imagery or, you know, actual collections of the animal to look at let's say internal morphology that you just don't get with um, visual data alone. And so, you know, that is, that is the current situation, but even genus level information, we just don't have, we just don't have looks or we just don't have an, a sufficient observations of, of life at this point. Um, and even genus level IDs is, is a fantastic um, advance forward for us. And that's the goal, right? To have you know, thousands of images per species so that we can get to the, the finest level of taxonomy possible. But right. like you say, in some cases, it's just not going to be possible because you can't count the gonads or you know, whatever that identifying thing is in, in the creature. Um, a great question from Jorge. Uh, how are the IDs guaranteed? Right. So this is a, an important piece of the process, which we will go over. I think Brian will probably talk about this within the website. Um, you know, unlike some databases, there is a level of verification that's required uh, where, you know, someone with the, the taxonomic expertise is able to go through and verify if the ID is, is accurate or close. I will talk about uh, tomorrow the some of the based on feedback we've already gotten from like our, our workshop last year, some of the the changes that we're making to FathomNet, at least the web user interface, so that we can uh, allow people to provide um, uh, like other guesses or suggestions, but also comment on those suggestions so that we can eventually land on the right ID. But again, this is all driven by the community, um, people who have this expertise and this knowledge. Great, thanks. Um, we're gonna need to take a break from questions right now. Um, I encourage the FathomNet team, there are a lot of great questions in the chat. Um, so if you have a moment to take a look at those and please reply, um, that would be great. And now we are going to hear from Brian Schleining. Brian is a senior software engineer in the research and development division at Embari. Um, he's gonna be telling us more about the FathomNet interface, how to log in, um, probably address many of the questions that are in the, uh, in the chat right now. Um, Brian has worked on numerous projects involving video and image analysis, video annotation, numerical analysis, user interface development, and data management systems at Ambari for more than 25 years. Uh, most recently, he's been the brains behind the back end of FathomNet and will now give us a tour of the FathomNet website and many other interactive features. So I'll turn it over to Brian. Great, thank you, Katie. And uh, greetings, everyone. Thank you for attending our workshop. This is a real treat to be able to present our work to you. Um, I've already been introduced. So again, I'm gonna be talking about FathomNet website and the application programming interface. And as Kikani has already mentioned, uh, this is a beta software. We are in development and we do have, we have gotten a lot of feedback. We do have a lot of features that we're working on, although they're not published out yet. But what's important is we want to get feedback from you so we can help improve our website and uh, make a better tool for the whole community. Um, we do have a site where we are collecting feedback. So if you are on GitHub, you can go to github.com at Fathomit. There's a repo called community feedback and you can enter feedback as issues there. So what I'll be talking about today is just briefly going over the FathomNet concepts and architecture so you understand what's underneath the hood of FathomNet. 
I'll give you a tour of the website to show you all the features and how it works. And then um, I'm gonna talk about the data schema just briefly so that if you do write some code, for example, using uh, Kevin's um, Python API, you understand a little bit of how the data is structured and modeled. So the Fathomit architecture is super simple. The idea is that a group has images and they host them on a web server and make that web server, those images um, public to the world through that web server. Then uh, they can submit the location of those images and the localization to Fathomnet, and we store that information in a database, which we expose to the world through our web API. And a web API is a standard practice. It's really easy to write all kinds of software to it. You can write any program in language basically to interact with the Fathomnet API. The Fathomnet website itself is a web application that runs in your browser. And just a few important concepts I'm going to cover now. First, we are not another annotation tool. I'll talk more about that. I want to give you a, a really concrete idea of what we mean by bounding boxes and localizations. And then I'm going to introduce the concept of taxonomy providers. Now, the intended lifecycle of Fathomnet, we weren't really, our goal wasn't to create another annotation tool. There's fantastic tools out in the community. And we, we encourage you to keep using those tools. However, one thing I would encourage for those people who are working, say using Beagle or Squiddle or whatever your tool is, is we are discussing with them integrations with Fathomnet, but it would be really helpful for them to know if that's important to you. The more people that tell them it's important, the faster that work will get done. So we encourage you to lean on them a little bit. Anyway, you can annotate with your preferred tool, export those out, that data out um, as bounding boxes, and import those into Fathomnet. Once that data is in Fathomnet, there are some lightweight annotation tools that you can use to refine these annotations. For example, uh, you might be a specialist in squids and you may look at the cystic tooth and say, well, actually, I know the species of this. And you could correct that in Fathomnet if you have sufficient permissions. Now, when we talk about localization, we're very specific about what we mean. Uh, it's a description of what was seen in the image. And it's kind of something mentioned uh, a bounding box around uh, the object that's being labeled. We use an image co coordinate system, and the origin of the system is the upper left corner, uh, plus x is to the right, plus y is down, um, and then we have the width and height of the bounding box, and this is all in pixels. Now, underneath that, we have this idea of taxonomy providers. Uh, the idea is that we didn't really want to constrain what people name things. There are a lot of ideas out there. Um, there's, you know, standard classical taxonomy. There's Katami codes. There's Smarter ID. There's different morpho taxes types, and we want to be able to plug in different providers if they had APIs. So currently, we have three that are plugged in. We have Ambari's Knowledge Base, uh, which is good for the California West Coast. We have the Worms, straight to the Worms API, um, which is a little. Uh, fragile because we're abusing their API in ways it wasn't meant to be used. And then we have the Fathom Nets uh, taxonomy provider, which is a subset of the worms data um, and it's customized for work working with FathomNet. So it's a fast, robust uh, taxonomy provider. And the way these work is uh, if you do a search, you say, well, I want to use a taxonomy provider. When you go to click the search button, you'll see this little uh, pop up appear. You know, there's two options, exact match and all descendants. And you say, well, I just want an exact match. I want to search just for things that are labeled Bathocordaeus, you know, the genus Bathocordaeus. And that's all I want. That's great. It'll return your search results that, and match that term exactly. And you'll get, in this case, 1,300 results. Or you could say, well, I actually want to extend that search. I want to train this model on all types of Bathocordaeus. So you could say, all right, I'm going to search for Bathocordaeus using Fathomnet Taxonomy Provider. And what will happen under the hood is it will take that genus, expand out, walk the tree, and grab all the different types of Bathocordaeus, expand the search out to all those types, and then return the matching results. And in this case, we now get 3,300 results. And so with that, I'm going to give you a, a nice little tour of the website. So bear with me one second. OK. So this is the Fathomet website. And when you land here, um, first thing you'll notice is nice prominent search box. 
and this will appear in different parts of the website. And I'll, I'll cover this in a moment, but I'm gonna scroll down the page a little bit to get to the middle, just to show you our current statistics. Um, we currently have 175,000 localizations and 84,000 images, and we have 340 contributors. And these contributors are actually the names of people who have annotated. So if, when you submit annotations, you can say who have made the observation. So 340 different people have created annotations that live in Fathomnet. So we're not quite where we want to be, but we're slowly working our way towards uh, the idea of thousands of localizations per animal in worms. OK, I just clicked on the Explorer tab. Let me go back just to show you what I did again. I'm going to the Explorer button right here. Clicking on that, uh, it'll take you to this page with that same search bar there. And we're just going to run a few quick searches to show you how this works. So we're going to go to Bathos because that is a very popular animal in the database, and we'll run a search for it. And what this brings up is all the matches. So we have our 1,300 results. And if those images have uh, latitude and longitude, they'll appear on the map. And if you click on that, it'll show you the corresponding image there. And these images are all paged, so you can scroll down to the bottom and page through images if you want to browse them. And I'm going to move this. And then once you have um, found all the results you want, you can click Select All here, and, or just select, manually select the image you want for your training set. You can click the Download button. And this will download the data as uh, structured data as JSON. And that JSON looks like Bear with me one second as I try to escape out of full screen. Um, it's just uh, text data that you can read and easy to parse in a variety of, of uh, programming languages and has all the information about the bounding boxes. And I'm not going to cover this in detail. I just wanted to show you a little snippet of what that looks like. OK. So now um, we do have other constraints you can add for your searches. Uh, I know someone posted in chat about um, searching in uh, uh, just specific regions. You can do that. You could say, all right, I just want to search in the Gulf of California, if I can spell Gulf of California. And in this case, it will constrain the search by a region. So this will return all the localizations in a region. So if you want to train a module model for a specific area, you can constrain that. And these all add together. So I can say, well, I just want the Bath of Cordaeus in the Gulf of California. We can do that. And then I might say, well, all right, I, I want to expand the search out to get all the different types of Bath of Cordaeus. And I can select a taxonomy provider. And again, now the pop ups change. You see exact match, all descendants, which we'll select. And that didn't change the results because there are only 19 there. So we'll remove the region. We'll rerun our search, and that will give us 3,300 results. Now, there are additional constraints here as you're browsing around trying to find the data that are interesting to you. Uh, you can search between dates. Uh, we do have a field called imaging type. Right now, the only imaging type we have listed is ROV, but we recognize that people may submit uh, images that may be some type of microscopy, maybe black and white images, or some other uh, different type of imaging cameras. So a way to record that information here and allow people to constrain their searches by it. Um, you can also constrain by owner institution who actually owns the images. And then of course, there's verification status, which uh, we touched on briefly during the question session. Um, the idea is here is that when you submit an image, uh, initially it's unverified. And at some point, someone will go through who has sufficient permissions, and they can say, yes, this is indeed um, uh, Bathocordaeus, for example. And I'll show you a little bit more details about that in a second. OK. All right, so right now, oh, I'm going to sign out. Um, you can do all these exploration functions signed out. And I'm going to click on an image and show you this is a single image that I clicked on in the, in the, the grid there. Uh, this image is verified. It means in this case, Kakani has gone through and said, yes, these 
localizations are correct. I'm sure she probably made these localizations too. And this image browser right here, uh, if you just see there's a several bounding boxes, if you hover over the label on the side, it'll show you which label it corresponds to. In this case, they're all the same label. So it's not particularly exciting. And now we're going to go back. I'm going to change something. Now I'm going to sign in. So right now, when you sign in, uh, the only provider we have wired in right now is Google. Uh, we are looking at uh, having other authentication providers logged in, but for right now, you need a Google account. So I'm just going to log in. And I have, um, well, I'm the admin, so I have permissions to do anything on the website. But what I'll be demonstrating here is if you had moderator positions, if you were allowed to uh, make changes in Fathomnet. And what I'm doing is I'm just clicking on the image and it'll switch over to the editor. Now that I'm in the editor as an, a, a moderator, I can select these annotations and I can modify them. I can move the boxes around. I can uh, change the label to something else if I wanted to, um, like that. Um, and so I do have permissions to make those changes. And, and you can also add annotations. So I just click on the add annotation button here. It'll put a new box and I can move it, resize it and um, call it whatever I want. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the image details and not save my changes right now. Oh, actually, while I'm in this, uh, at the bottom, there are also these arrows. So you can navigate through your, your search image set just by clicking on these arrows, it'll move from image to image, like so. Okay, let's go back to image details. And now I'm gonna go back to the Explorer view for a second, uh, just to show you one more thing. Uh, if I click on one that has a position, if the data, if this uh, image does have latitude, longitude, et cetera, that information will appear so you can see that information. We also, can store salinity, temperature, pressure, but that won't be displayed by default in the website. In addition, uh, each image may belong to some collections. Actually, before I go to that, I just wanna mention one more thing about the login process. When you log in the first time, um, Uh, you will have read-only permissions. You will not be able to submit data to FathomNet and you will not um, be able to make changes. Right now, the process to get elevated permissions is you would send an email to FathomNet at embari.org and ask for elevated permissions. And we do have a document describing this that we'll link to later. Um, and just say, hey, I'd like to submit data to FathomNet or hey, this is my background. I would like to be able to edit and add additional localizations to fathom it. All right. Now, back to collections. There's a little field here called collections. Now, an image may belong to more than one collection. In this case, it's a single collection. And if you click on that, it will take you to that collection page that will show you all the images in that particular collection and any Darwin core metadata that belong to the image that were submitted with the collection. And again, if I now that I've clicked on a collection, if I select an image and um, again, there's these next and previous errors at the bottom, this will just walk me through the images in that collection. And be warned that it's now what you search for in the Explorer, it's just showing the results from this particular collection. Okay. So let's say you're interested in submitting data to FathomNet. So the first step, of course, is you log in. And then once you've logged in, uh, you'll see a little, if you go to the homepage, you'll see your little um, avatar that from Google appear in the corner. If you click on that, it'll take you to your profile page. If you would like elevated permissions, or even if you're a scientist that are interested in working with FathomNet and us more, please take a moment to fill out some areas here. Uh, there's some fields for work, 
for example, your organization, and this one is your position, job title. So fill those in and a little bit about you and your expertise so that we know something about that you. So that way, when you do ask for hand, say, hey, I'd like to submit data or I'd like to make changes, we know who you are. Um, while I'm here, there's one other bit you should be aware of. If you're work using the FathomMets API, um, you might need the API key if you want to make changes to uh, some data in FathomMet. So in your account, you can just go to the API key uh, tab here, click on this generate, and it'll generate API key that you can use um, to work with the FathomMet API. If you want a new key, it's easy enough to get rid of your old key and regenerate a new key. All right. Now you might be wondering, well, how do I submit data to FathomNet? And I'll talk about this in much more detail in the Marine Scientist Breakout, but just a brief overview is there's a, um, a link at the top called My Collections. And if you click on that, it'll take you to this page that shows you all the collections of data that you may have submitted or not have submitted yet. Um, and if this is blank, that's okay, don't worry about it. But here, there'll be a button that says add collection. And if you click on that, it'll take you to this page where you can upload a CSV file. Now, when you upload the CSV file, you also have to submit additional metadata to describe your data set. And we follow the Darwin Core metadata standard. So there's a number of fields that are pre-filled in based on your information already. And then at the bottom, there's optional fields that you could also add information about. And if you have a question about what any of these are, you can just click on it and it will take you to the appropriate link in the Darwin core. Oops. And bear with me while I wrestle with full screen mode again. Okay. Once you've filled in all the metadata you feel is appropriate for your data set, as you go to the bottom, there's just a place to say, Select the CSV file, comma, separated value text file that describes your localizations. You click on that, and then you can upload um, your data to FathNet. Once it's uploaded, it generally takes a few minutes to process, and then it will be available through FathomNet. Sounds easy. Uh, and again, if you need more details, come to my breakout session. I will talk in much more detail about this. Now, a little bit about the data itself. Um, I'm gonna click on the About Us link at the top, and this describes FathomNet's terms of use. And I'll go straight to the terms of use section. If you do submit images to FathomNet, this describes the rights that you are giving to people for these images. For the most part, images in FathomNet are, well, let's start with the annotations. Annotations are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution No Derivative International License, it's a pretty freeform license that allows people to use the annotations for a variety of purposes. The images, however, are under a slightly modified license. They are under, also under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, international license. However, they are for specific purpose. Oops. They are for training development of machine learning algorithms for commercial, academic, or government purposes. So as long as people are using the images for those purposes open only, it's okay. If they want to use them for any other purpose, uh, advertising, uh, education, whatever, um, they need to co contact the original copyright holder and they can obtain that information through the collections links that are provided with each image. Uh, in addition to that, we do have a couple other uh, terms. Um, if you do use images from FathomNet, please acknowledge FathomNet in your publication or project. Uh, if you do any kind of enrichment, say you say, hey, I, I, this is great, and I developed this great novel way to use data from FathomNet, that's fantastic, and we encourage that. Uh, we would like to be able to share your work through our social channels to help spread the word around. And then finally, um, we do we are following the benevolent use the data. This data will only be used in ways that are consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
And if you wonder what those are, you could just click on the link and, and read the, the goals there. Okay, well, that was the FabNet website. And I'm gonna return now to my presentation. Okay, so we're returning back to our API diagram. And I'm gonna discuss just a little bit about the database and web API now and give you an overview of the data structure. We have a very, very simple database schema. If you don't know database schemas, that's fine. Uh, I'll tell you what everything is here. Uh, the core of FathomNet is that we are basically an image browser for machine learning. We store information about pictures. Within each picture, we have boxes to describe what people see in the image. We provide tags as a flexible way to store information that we did not plan for. So if, for example, you are recording quantum flux with your images and you want to attach it to your images in FabNet, you can do it. You can, we have key value pairs that you can attach any kind of information you want to an image. And getting a little more specific, um, we point at images through a URL. So the image can live anywhere on the World Wide Web. It does not have to be hosted at Fathomnet. We do store location and uh, salinity, temperature, depth, oxygen information with the images if you provide it. And for naming, we have that, we, our, our primary name is called a concept. Um, instead of names or label, we just say this is the concept that's we're describing. We also have a field called alt concept. This is the alternate concept. Primarily, we've been using that for labeling organism parts. So for example, we may say, here's a whole nanomia, but here's just the nectosome of an anomia. And so the concept would be nomia. The alt concept would be nectosome. We track a lot of names in our database. We track who made the observation. We track who verified or confirmed the name in, of the observation. We track who uploaded the data. And then we also track who owns the images. And all this information is available through the API and can be downloaded when you download information from FathomNet. Our API is fully documented. So it's there if you're a programmer, have at it. Um, we have different flavors for if you like different flavors of documentation. I've linked one at the bottom. That's fathomnet.org. 8080 slash swagger UI. And that is my presentation. So if there's any questions, now's the time. Thanks, Brian. We do have a few minutes for questions. Um, there's one already in the chat. Are any of those image metadata fields required? Uh, the only fields that are required are the, you need the URL to the image uh, concept, the name of what you're describing, and the coordinates of the bounding box, the X, Y, width, and height. Everything else is optional. Great. Um, can you drop that link here in the chat? Brandy, do you mean the fat, just the FathomNet website or a different link? To the API at the end. Can you put that yes. link in the chat, Brian? Yep, give me one second. Awesome, thanks. Now I gotta say after all this time with COVID, you'd think I'd be used to giving Zoom chats, but it still feels weird. There's always a surprise. So what kind of experience would be required to be able to get access to verify or upload images or code to mm -hmm. the open source platform? So it sounds like what are, you know, what are the requirements to do different things? That, that's Uploading a great images question. versus verifying versus contributing to the code. Uh, that's a fantastic question. And it's a bit of a loaded one. Uh, right now, unfortunately, we're a bit of, we're gatekeepers. Um, you would submit an email to us and just ask for it. And then we would, um, you know, look at your background, talk to people we know in the community and 
say, yeah, this is a good guy or a good person. Um, they can make changes, sure. Um, but we are working on different ways to do that. And that is a, an open question that we are working on. Is there an obvious way to do that on the website? Like, is there a form to fill out? Say, I would like to verify. Uh, no. Not yet. <laughs> Tomorrow Not yet. there will be. <laughs> well, Tomorrow there might be. <laughs> Um, but what about uploading images? That's open, right? So, Im uh, okay, so upload images, th this is a little loaded right now. Mm -hmm. The way we designed it was we thought, well, people would host their own images because they own them and they would want to have control of them. And they would submit the CSV that points the images to fathom it. It turns out that's uh, been a challenge for many people. Um, a lot of organizations, you know, like universities have really restrictive sharing policies and it's been a problem for labs to share those images. So right now we're working with NOAA. We set up a memorandum of understanding with them. Um, and we've entered the technical phase to set up a pipeline where you can actually submit a zip file of images with the CSV. And those will be staged on a server somewhere. And NOAA will actually archive those images and make them publicly available for 75 years for us and for you. But that's not in place yet. That's a, a work in progress. Great. Um, how do we, great question from Gustav, how do we handle disagreements in identification? Uh, <laughs> we, uh, that's a great question. Um, that's something we've gone back and forth with quite a bit. And I think, Kakani, you're going to be presenting on that on the last day. So we have some thoughts on it, but again, that is not something that's fully fleshed out. Um, we do have some uh, bits to present to you about that, though. Great. We realize that's going to be a problem. I, I will. I will add, like you know, we want to be clear that we don't want to be gatekeepers. Like we want the community to help us with that process, right? And so, we've got some new user interfaces that we've been talking about incorporating into the um, website to help handle disagreements. Um, but at the end of the day, we want the community to tell us how they would prefer those disagreements to be handled. Great. One last question before we move on to Ben uh, from Alva. Are we removing water from the annotated underwater images? Uh, no. Um, I think part of the idea with the machine learning is it, it depends on your use case, of course, but you want to have a variety of images um, because let's say like you're Kakani and you're out running the sub in various conditions. Well, you you want if you remove the water from the images, then you're going to have to do the same thing pre-process the video before in real time before you can use it for tracking. So the idea is that um, you want to again train on a variety of images, and you want that water there. Great, thanks, Brian. Thank you so much, and we will please feel free to continue putting questions in the chat and in the Q and A, and the team will will try to keep up with those as best as we can. Um, now we're going to go to Ben Woodward, who will um, give an overview of Tater. This is an online video annotation tool that integrates with FathomNet. Um, ben is CEO of CVision AI. It's a machine learning startup, um, not so startup-y anymore, that develops innovative video analytics products to harness the power of computer vision and artificial intelligence. Ben specializes in video analysis software, automatic detection and tracking solutions, and creating and curation of data sets for algorithmic development. And he has been a key part of the FathomNet team since the very beginning. So I'll turn it over to you, Ben. OK, sorry about that, everybody. And yep, thank no you. Hopefully, this is working now. Um, Look, looks great. OK, awesome. Well, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here and talking about this. Uh, I wanted to reiterate a point that, that Brian had kind of made is that um, we, for FathomNet, we want to encourage any and all annotation tools that you are comfortable with. What I'm going to be talking about here is how our tool Tater specifically can work with FathomNet and why we started to, to build it. So um, definitely, definitely not trying to say that Tater is the only thing that could work. I mean, we even have VARs from Impari as well. So um, we want to make it so that all the tools can work with uh, FathomNet. So what is Tater? Uh, Tater is a web-based platform for collaborative analysis of media. 
Um, basically, um, it is a web-based tool for some of a lot of the, um, excuse me, a lot of the um, native tools that you may have seen. Uh, and our, our basically our main organizing principles behind it are uh, scalability and performance. Uh, so when we first started doing this back in 2015, we created a native application based on C++ uh, to handle video data because there were not a lot of tools at the time that could handle some of the um, needs that we needed for frame accurate annotation with all of the bounding boxes we were doing. Um, and later we kind of transitioned this to a web-based app and it eventually became funded by a no SBIR and some of our early collaborators such as National Geographic. Um, and so what it can handle now is a lot of your kind of digital asset management, data management, uh, ETL, uh, as well as video and image annotation. Um, and with, with that, you basically get all of the integrations with FathomNet is what we'll kind of talk about as we go on. So when I say performance, what do I mean? Uh, I mean the ability to stream thousands of hours of video um, with multiple resolutions uh, to be able to handle all, all of the kind of annotation needs that, that you may want to be able to see. Uh, let me see the video play here, right? Um, so when we get video in, we often get, you know, giant, giant piles of hard drives. So many, many hundreds of terabytes of data recorded in codecs such as ProRes 422, where you know you get this great cinematic quality video um, suitable for video editing or for really, really, really kind of high quality uh, purposes for cinematic purposes, not so great for kind of streaming over uh, an internet connection. So we take this video in uh, and we transcode it into not just one uh, resolution, but uh, multiple resolutions uh, that are nearly visually lossless while still maintaining a uh, 98% kind of basically data compression ratio. Uh, and what we're able to do then is turn that into frame accurate playback where you can scrub through video um, at a very low resolution to get an idea of what's there. And when you're ready to annotate it, you can pause and we immediately fetch the highest resolution frame that's available to you there. And that's kind of a really kind of neat trick for you to be able to uh, stream this video at a lower band bit rate, uh, lower internet bandwidth, uh, so that you can kind of get where you want to be. And then when you're ready to annotate, you still get that highest quality stuff that you're ready when you're ready to kind of draw your boxes and, and do your contributions um, to your analysis. And so you see that here, um, you, you are able to basically move forward at very high resolutions and then, um, you know, or sorry, rather at very low resolutions. And when you're ready to annotate, you can just kind of pause to, to that, that frame. Let me get out of this, All right? Uh, scalability. So what do I mean by scalability? Um, being able to move from just one user to thousands of users uh, seamlessly. Tater is built on Kubernetes, which is a container orchestrator uh, orchestration platform that allows us to run on any of your kind of cloud providers, Azure, AWS, GCP, uh, Oracle or your own uh, bare metal resources um, or a mix and match between the two of them. Uh, and so you can handle situations such as, you know, a spike in users from an analyst signing on for the day, or you return from a cruise and you've got, you know, 1500 hours of videos that you need to upload and you need them uploaded now, uh, not in three weeks when the single machine that you have dedicated to doing your transcoding is ready to do that. Um, so we're able to scale up and down resources seamless, seamlessly, uh, as well as kind of honor any sort of data sovereignty requirements you may have. So we have some users who require very tight access to the actual source data itself. So they have storage infrastructure stored on their height, uh, their um, their host site, uh, while still using Tater as a kind of a cloud native application, so that they can um, log in from anywhere and still access that data. Uh, one Tater instance can host multiple organizations. So what you see on the bottom left there is an example where um, there is a, a, a company that does uh, scalloping um, uh, surveys for the Canadian government. Uh, and they just put these scallops on there and they have a need to have an algorithm that uh, can box and measure those scallops. Uh, what you see in the bottom middle there is an example of the NOAA capstone data, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, where uh, expeditions from the Okeanos Explorer can be uploaded into the platform and then anyone can access them. 
Uh, and then on the bottom right there, uh, what we have are was a program that had um, fisheries observers who were taking images to the, of samples that they collected at sea and had a need for an interface for algorithm and human annotations to be able to be gelled together. And all of these projects are on the same instance of Tater and are just configured for each of those uh, each of those projects uh, metadata need. Excuse me. <clears throat> so some of the some of the basic features that are available to you on Tater um, are your kind of your standard zoom and pan controls, which you see there on the left. Your video controls for moving forward, fast forward, rewind, uh, frame seeking on the bottom left. Uh, your rate controls you can play back up to sixty four x. Um, you can have uh, you can have resolution streaming up to 4K, um, and you can set various kind of kind of like kind of like your complex um, video settings on YouTube, uh, and then that that kind of high resolution on pause trick that you get. So streaming at 720 is a pretty standard thing for people to do when they pause. They'll fetch that 4K frame because you know they don't have that Netflix connection for them to really be able to stream 4K at. Um, on the upper right there, you can have the ability to create links for any of your collaborators uh, if they have an account and permissions on your on your project to be able to go directly to that video, um, so-called kind of phone a friend to help you do any sort of the identification on a box that you've drawn uh, or set up kind of QA, QC procedures. Uh, and then you have your standard annotation tools, so you can draw boxes, lines, dots, uh, polygons, uh, you can create tracks. Um, and then uh, in the top right there, you have the ability to kind of select versions. You can think of these kind of as like uh, layers in Google Maps so that everyone can be operating on their own version, or you can have an algorithm or a host of algorithms that you're trying out and you don't have them all squished down onto the same layer. So you have the ability to kind of view them kind of in sequence and keep them separate for when you're ready to either export them to FathomNet or you know have a candidate uh, review uh, for algorithms. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the right hand side is what we call the entity browser. This is the main way of interacting with data within the platform. This kind of tells you what is in your video and all the information about it. Uh, the fields you see on the right hand side there are completely customizable by, by projects. So any sort of information you, you can have there. Um, a lot of a lot of our projects would map directly to information that you would want to capture for export to FathomNet. So that would be a, a great advantage there of, of, of doing something like that. If you want to get started um, contributing to FathomNet, we have data hosted from three NOAA Okeanos Explorer uh, cruises now, um, and we're continuing to ramp that up. Uh, and we can give you access to those so you can go watch, download, annotate, uh, and can, you know, contribute to those analyses right now. Um, if you send, drop an email there, we can make you an account, make you a layer, uh, and then we can start the process of getting people. Beg you your pardon? Oh, someone went off mute. Um, so we can get you started with uh, starting to contribute to FathomNet uh, via. Uh, data from Okeanos Explorer right now. Um, the bottom link you see there is an excellent kind of overview of the platform uh, created by University of Dallas student um, in Dr. Soper's lab, Caroline Stone. Um, she's uh, Dr. Soper and her students have been working with us for the past, well, I guess, almost two years now to start to contribute uh, and make a high quality annotations from the NOAA Capstone project, uh, which was annotated by experts using VARs, actually, as it, as it turns out. So we have very highly frame accurate annotations, which we're able to import into the platform and only need to add localizations to before we can export out to Fathom. Um, so it's, it's a very kind of tight cycle that we're able to kind of uh, support by using uh, Tater with Fathomnet. When you're done kind of doing all of that stuff, you may want to kind of review all the boxes that you've drawn um, you get this nice kind of uh, grid style, grid view style um, analyst, analysis gallery um, where you can do things like filter based on your layer or version. You can filter based on concept. Basically, any of the metadata that you've set up, um, you're able to filter on. You can do bulk updates of your metadata, um, and then you can flag things for, for example, uh, export to FathomNet. And so you may go through and annotate an entire, um, you know, say cruise worth of videos 
And then from that, you generate the annotations on say 1500 frames. Those frames can then be tagged uh, and then extra extracted as uh, PNGs or JPEGs to put in a standalone place, and then they become exportable into FathomNet. Um, what, one of the things that kind of Brian had mentioned is that because FathomNet is not a hosting mechanism by itself, you need the ability to generate those static URLs that FathomNet can then crawl, uh, as well as then generate the CSV to be able to upload uh, to FathomNet. And so that's what you get uh, via uh, doing things with Tater that way. Um, in addition to uh, those UI centric things, we have a full RESTful API, similar to the one that Brian had mentioned for um, FathomNet, as well as a full set of Python bindings. Again, uh, Kevin will go over the, the Python API for, for FathomNet, but uh, it should feel very familiar between the two, two applications. Uh, and then so using that, you can do interesting things like uh, put, put a whole bunch of observations and their metadata into Panda's data frame, start to do um, you know, online uh, machine learnings where you can do similarity search like you see in the middle there, or kind of anything you can think of to kind of grab information from the platform that you've generated and do your analysis outside of that. Excuse me. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we have an integrated dashboard for generating FathomNet submissions. When you're ready to go ahead and do that, you can follow the steps there. Um, there's even a nice blog post that's made that it's in the uh, FathomNet medium that shows you how to do that. Um, I won't talk too much more about that because you can go read that article. But essentially what happens is once you flagged your data, you can generate the FathomNet URLs and CSVs, uh, and then you can upload those observations to FathomNet. And that's how we actually do things for the NOAA OER data through the University of Dallas uh, uh, partnership. Uh, and then you can basically kind of script to your heart's content. Uh, so if you have another third party or uh, you're good at doing HTML or JavaScript uh, scripting, you can, you can kind of go ahead and do that yourself, write your own plugin uh, and register within the platform to, to do things. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we do have the ability for you to export, not just to FathomNet, but also just CSV files for you to kind of do your own type of analysis with. So uh, if you wanna go through a QA, QC or scrubbing procedure before you uh, submit to FathomNet, that's something that you can do as well. You can just export all of the data and then uh, clear it down to just the data that you'd like to submit. Um, another thing that we offer is the ability to kind of register algorithms to do AI assisted annotation. Um, I know a number of other platforms do that as well, so I'm not kind of trying to say that this is a unique thing, but this is a kind of uh, a way that a lot of the platforms are going th these days to be able to use data, say from FathomNet, to train an object detector, register it within your platform, uh, and then essentially do that to start do tracking. I saw a question earlier in the chat about, about tracking and it's kind of the distinction between FathomNet and a lot of these other tools is that FathomNet right now is focused on images, but you wanna be able to take that data and use it on videos. So that's, that's what we kind of do here is the ability to kind of create little applets where you can register an algorithm trained on FathomNet data to do object detection, turn that into tracks. Those tracks then become observations that can then be refined, reviewed and exported back out to FathomNet. Um, and this is connected to the FathomNet model zoo, which will also be something that will be talked about a little later today. Uh, and then the, the another thing we can do, basically, finally, I'll kind of lead with is essentially the ability to interact with third party hosted video footage. So in this case, this just happens to be footage from Schmidt Ocean Institute uh, Research Vegetable Falcor, where they have data hosted on their platform. And what we were able to do is kind of ingest that by reference, similar to how FathomNet ingests images by reference, um, play that video here uh, within Tater generate observations within Tater, uh, and then those could then be turned into observations, which would give you a pipeline to, if you have the right permissions, uh, submit those to FathomNet. So that's something that we kind of um, have a little bit of initial talks with the um, Schmidt Ocean Institute folks about how to accomplish that. And we're working on trying to kind of tighten up that, that cycle so that data from, from their cruises could potentially be um, used either in Tater or other platforms to then be hosted or, or contributed to FathomNet rather. And so this is just an example of me playing data 
off of Schmidt Ocean Institute's uh, stream cache service, I believe, where I was going through and making, obviously, as you can tell, very taxonomically correct um, uh, annotations, which will then, of course, be approved and loaded into FathomNet uh, subsequently. Um, but that, that's just kind of an example of how you can accomplish all that. Um, and then, like I said, um, you can do kind of any sort of dashboards that you would like. Uh, if you want to do um, register machine learning training algorithms or services within the platform, you can do that. I know there's a lot of um, a lot of services like RoboFlow or MLflow, ClearML that basically allow weights and biases that allow you to basically reference a data set uh, and then do your training and then get a model output out. And so what we do is try not to replicate that process, but allow you the ability to integrate with those processes, do your training, integrate your algorithm, and then do a lot of your inference within the platform because there's so many good tools out there already for training algorithms. And with that, thank you for listening. Um, and I just want to emphasize again that this is just one example of tools and how they can be used to generate data, submit to FathomNet, to generate algorithms that can then make those tools better. Uh, and we hope that everyone uh, enjoyed this, that and does that with their tools as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And we do have uh, about 10 minutes actually um, for questions before we go to a break. And we have one already. Can I ask for the YouTube link that Brian mentioned about the NOAA OER data, please? A YouTube link or that Ben mentioned or tater. We'll get clarity on that. Thanks so much, Ben. It's great to see so many different data sources being used, um, being used in tater. So Ben mentioned a YouTube video from the University of Dallas. Do you have a link to that? Yeah, hold on. It's it's actually in the um, FathomNet YouTube. So I was just going to about to go find that and I'll post it in the chat one second. Awesome, thanks. Um, Wyatt is curious about the game. We have not talked about that and I am presuming that that's gonna be part of Kakani's talk tomorrow. We're not gonna mention game here today. <laughs> Getting a little ahead of ourselves. Um, Elva is curious how much memory is like, what are the requirements for being able to run an instance of Tater? Yeah, so there's kind of two parts of it. If you'd like to kind of host your own instance of that, sorry, I, I should have, there, there should have been a link in there, but Tater itself is an open source project. So you can run your own instance of it. It's, um, we interact with actually a, a large number of people and more and more kind of research labs who are self hosting their own instance of Tater to use that kind of stuff you are able to run it on kind of a single decently sized node. I, I wouldn't say probably less than 32 gigs of RAM uh, in a quad core CPU, especially if you're gonna be transcoding some high res video. But once you're able to kind of get that set up, accessing it merely requires you to have a browser and the ability to kind of talk, um, dial into the machine that's hosting Tater itself. And Aaron's been putting links to some of those resources on Tater, how to get started. Um, and that is in the chat. If there are no more at this point, I think we can go to our break. All right, we are back at the top of the hour. Most people are still logged in and hopefully um, others will be continuing to rejoin us. Hope you all had a great break. Um, we are now going to get into the nitty gritty of the FathomNet GitHub. So first we'll hear from Kevin Barnard. He's a software engineer at Embari and FathomNet database administrator. Kevin's background is in software development, robot perception and cognition and machine learning. And he first got involved with FathomNet as an undergraduate intern at Embari in 2018. So today Kevin is going to tell us about the Python API on the FathomNet GitHub. So we'll turn it over to you, Kevin. Awesome. Thanks so much, Katie. Let me start my screen share here. Okay, great. 
So I promise not too many slides here. I just quickly in the next 15 minutes want to go through three things. So I want to give you an overview first of the FathomNet GitHub page, what's on there. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about this Python API, which we've referenced a couple times before. And finally, which I want to spend the most of my time on, is I want to demonstrate a little bit of that uh, collab notebook that we talked about, which is just going to show a couple of visualizations and some powerful things that you can do with the Python API in very few lines of code. And as promised, it is all point and click. So uh, if you're not familiar with the code or Python at all, uh, don't worry, you can still fire it up just in your web browser and uh, click along through. All right. So first of all, though, uh, the FathomNet GitHub page is here at the link at the top, github.com slash FathomNet. If you're not familiar with GitHub, the basic idea is it's a space for us to uh, host uh, you know, repositories containing code or discussions, uh, registries, auxiliary data like our logos, uh, so on and so forth. And there's three repositories here that I want to specifically call out right now. The first one is this community feedback uh, repository. Uh, this is a general forum to leave feedback and ideas. We also are tracking some of our development tasks in this one. Uh, Kakani will dig into this a little bit more later. So the next one is the Python API, FathomNet-Pi, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. And the third one is models, or the FathomNet model zoo, and Eric is going to cover this um, up next. So let's take a look at this Python API. So you know, a lot of da data scientists, a lot of um, folks use Python. It's a very powerful programming language for doing um, you know, data science tasks, um, manipulating data, so on and so forth. So we figured we put together this API to help uh, interact with FathomNet in your Python programs. So this is broken down in just a couple components. The first one is there's this Python wrapper for calls to the FathomNet REST API, which Brian presented. So you can just, in Python, make calls like uh, you know, bounding boxes that find concepts, and that'll give you a list of all of the concepts that are currently present, uh, or you know, they have a localization in FathomNet. Or things like if you want to pull down an image, you can uh, do that, right? You can find all the images by a concept, you know, uh, crawl the taxonomic trees, and do all sorts of operations like that straight in Python. The next one is that there are these native uh, data classes that we've created for all the, of the FathomNet entities. So this allows you to do things like uh, load in JSON uh, that you've downloaded from the FathomNet website straight into your Python programs and vice versa, things like that. One third component here that which I want to call out is we do have a script that we've been working on, which helps you to generate data sets in different formats for object detection data sets. So uh, these are in uh, currently these this script supports uh, Coco, JSON, and uh, VOC XML. And finally, this is really easy to install. It's on the Python package index, uh, so you can just do a pip install FathomNet, and uh, you're off to the races. The full documentation I want to call out here uh, is available, the link at the bottom right, which is fathomnet-pi.readthedocs.io. Okay, that's been um, just the overview of the FathomNet GitHub. And now I want to give you a little bit of a demonstration of some of the things that you can do with this Python API in this Jupyter Notebook. Uh, this is going to be running in Google Colab, which is all in your web browser. You don't need to set up anything on your computer. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to follow along. We're going to be using this notebook as well for the programmer's breakout tomorrow. And if you lose track of where you are, just look for this badge, Open in Colab. If you press that, that'll uh, bring you to the notebook. Okay, so I have in another tab here the FathomNet GitHub page. On this, you'll see some of those repositories I was talking about. We're going to go to the FathomNet Pi one. Okay. And then in here, scroll down and you'll see this button here open in Colab. If you click that, that will go ahead and open up uh, the notebook instance for you. And you'll see there's a whole lot in here. I encourage you uh, in your spare time to read through this. Um, so I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, but I encourage you to, to look back at this, read through, and try uh, playing around with some of the things in here. All right. But quickly, I'm going to show you a little bit of how you can install the API and use it to generate some basic data visual visualizations. So as I said, you can just run a pip install FathomNet. So I've done gone ahead and done this in this cell. So pip install FathomNet, that will install FathomNet to your system. And it imports some things uh, that we need for this code. 
mostly just for the visualizations. And finally, let's talk about the API, right? So now that we have it installed, uh, as I said, there's two main components. There's the modules, which allow you to do these calls to the API and the data models. These modules are broken down into bounding boxes, things like images, image set uploads, marine regions, so on and so forth. So every API call that we make is just a single function within a certain module. So we can say, let's say we want to find a particular image by its unique ID. We can bring in the images module and then give the UUID to this function. So if we run that cell, this has gone ahead and contacted the FathomNet uh, API and pulled that image down. So we have now our example image. We can check out what that type is, and it is this FathomNet model of an image. So this is a native Python object that we can now uh, work with in our Python programs. So we don't have to necessarily deal with uh, the big blobs of JSON. We can go ahead and check out some of the fields that are available uh, in this object. So we can check out the URL, the latitude and the longitude, and the bounding boxes that are contained. I should mention, we haven't actually pulled down the image itself. Again, this is a description of the image, its bounding boxes, and the URL. We can also check out what the example image JSON is by doing this to JSON. And you'll see here, this looks exactly like uh, the JSON that you download when you go through the website. So as I said before, you can turn this back and forth between uh, this JSON format pretty easily. So next I'll show a couple of visualizations that you can do. Um, let's say we wanna make a bar chart of the top you know, 10 concepts, let's say in FathomNet um, by the number of bounding boxes that they have associated with them. Well, we can pull in the bounding boxes module, count how many bounding boxes each concept has, and then throw that in a bar chart. So if I run this cell, I'll we'll go ahead and contact FathomNet. It'll get all of that information and then put that together in this bar chart. So we can check out, we can see, okay, we have 15,000 localizations of fragile urchins um, and so on and so forth for some of this stuff. All right, uh, next let's say we want to get all of the images that are for a particular concept. Well, we can use the bounding boxes module and the images modules together. So we can get a list of all of the concepts that are localized in FathomNet using this function. All right, and we can see, okay, there are 2,242 localized concepts in FathomNet. We'll select one. And then what we can do is ask FathomNet for all of the images of that concept. Great. So this is now telling us that we have 529 images of a genus Citria. Let's pick a random image and then go to its URL and download that image. Might take a second. There we go. Okay. So we can see here that we've actually fetched that image from its URL and now we're showing that right in the notebook. We can also go through the bounding boxes in that image and then render them on top, let's say. Okay, awesome. So what we've done is now looked at that image, its bounding box, and based on the coordinates, just drawn this box and attached the label to it. Now let's check out some of the uh, ancillary data that's also in, uh, included with these image records that we've, we've fetched. So we can also get things like the depth. Uh, so maybe we wanna see a histogram of the different depths that we have images of Aegina at. Well, we can pull from each image its depth and then put that into a histogram. So I'll run that cell and there we go. Now we can see that Aegina Citria, we have most at this 1200 to 1300 meter range. You can also get the latitude and the longitude from images where they are available. And in this uh, cell, we're just going to plot those as a heat map of all of the images of Aegina Citria over this Esri Ocean base, base map. So we can get an idea of 
uh, where these images are coming from. Okay, so that was just a very brief overview of some of the uh, visualization capabilities and interaction uh, faculties that we have available in the FathomNet Python notebook, uh, or API, sorry. But in the rest of this notebook, we have a lot more content. Again, we're going to get into that tomorrow in the programmer's breakout. But again, if you are curious to check this out, this uh, notebook is publicly available on the FathomNet Pi repository. Um, so that's all I got. I'll turn it back to you, Katie. Very good, Kevin. Um, yeah, we do have a couple minutes for questions. And um, there is one which uh, Eric answered, but I think it's worth highlighting. Um, you, you're giving this example in Python, which is great. Is it also compatible with other coding software, such as RStudio? Sure. So the particular library that I just showed is for Python exclusively. Um, however, what this Python library is doing is it's just communicating with the rest uh, web API. So if you wanted to do something like this in R, you could put together something similar um, that then talks uh, over you know, HTTP to uh, the, the REST API. Great. Any more questions? We have about a minute, and then we'll um, dive into more. One more question? Okay, we'll turn it over to Eric. Eric Ornstein um, is going to tell us a bit more about the FathomNet GitHub Model Zoo. Eric is uh, working in the Bioinspiration Lab with Kakana Katija, and his research lives at the intersection of machine learning, ocean imaging, and marine ecology. And he's been on the FathomNet team, um, primarily establishing benchmarks and designing metrics to improve the database um, interpretability facilitate access and ease automated model development. Um, and we've been talking about ways to make um, this process and interacting with GitHub um, more accessible. So stay tuned for updates on that too. So I'll turn it over to you, Eric, um, to talk about the model zoo. Great, thanks, Katie. Uh, you can just give me a second to share the right screen. All right, can everybody see that? off to the races, lovely. Um, okay, so uh, like Katie said, uh, I'm Eric. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the FathomNet model zoo and uh, a couple of different ways to interact with it and, and what specifically we mean by model and zoo. Um, so just getting back to what Kevin was talking about just a minute ago on the FathomNet uh, GitHub page, there are a bunch of different things on there that you might be interested in. Uh, the community feedback, FathomNet Pi, which is what Kevin was just talking about. And what I'm going to get into is the model zoo. Um, so before we, we dig into what's on there right now, I'm just going to talk very, very briefly about what we mean by a model. Um, so in this case, very generally, we're talking about some sort of mathematical mapping between an input and a desired output. Um, so what we mean in the context of FathomNet is we take an image, and what we want out of it is a label, a localization, or both. Um, so for example, if we start with this lovely image of Aegina, uh, this, this jellyfish, we plug it into our magic black box O machine learning, and out the other end pops its name, Aegina. Or alternatively, a bounding box with the annotation. And there are all sorts of other types of ways of looking at an image like this. Um, there are different sorts of annotation formats, uh, all of which we can talk about more later. Um, but in general, what a lot of people are looking at doing these days is using a specific type of model called a deep learning model. Um, so generally speaking, there's a lot of value in sharing your models, uh, but especially when it comes to deep learning models and neural networks. Um, so open sourcing your models helps others use them, but also helps them train their own models. Um, so broadly speaking, uh, this is a process called fine tuning. So if you share your model, uh, you have your source data, some number of layers, and then you have outputs. So others can use this as source data by using the layers that you generated as pre-training. So it turns out that many of these earlier layers in a network are quite general. So another user could copy that information over to a new model for their particular target data set, which might be very different from your data set, and then fine tune 
the original layers based on a new output layer that they're training from scratch to get their target model. So in other words, uh, this would help float all boats, so to speak. If you put your model out there, others might be able to use it to move more quickly from having a model that doesn't necessarily work in their environment to something that might let them annotate their data much more rapidly. So this brings us back to the model zoo. So if you were to go onto the FathomNet GitHub page and click through to the model zoo, you'd end up on a landing page like this. And, and really what it consists of at this particular time is a readme that contains a little bit of information about the use policy related to models um, and then lists out models that are available. So we have them indexed in a table. And currently in there, we have a few object detection models, which is one of those situations where you're trying to both localize and classify things in the frame. Um, and we have these indexed in a couple of different ways. So first we have a model name, which is just a semantic description of um, what, what the model is and does. So in this case, we're looking at one that we called the Mbari uh, Monterey Bay Benthic Object Detector. Um, and this is actually the, the model that was used to create that annotated video that Kakani showed in her talk earlier. Um, we suggest that people, when they upload their model, create a digital object identifier so others can easily cite it. Um, and I'll talk a bit more in just a second about how to do that uh, with one particular resource called Zenodo. Um, we have a list of the model class so people know what particular type of model they might be using, uh, the habitat that it is geared towards, and then a longer description. Um, so there are lots of different ways to, to do this um, in terms of the description and the DOI generation, um, but we recommend um, people index their models with Zenodo um, because it makes them uh, available permanently and makes them easy to access while providing an archive of your model. So just briefly, what is Zenodo? Um, Zenodo is an open access repository that's maintained by the European Organization for Nuclear Research, or CERN. Um, they originally developed this uh, to support work being done at the Large Hadron Collider, which generates huge amounts of data that they needed to be able to easily share between um, the, the different people working on that large international resource. Um, but because they built this huge data structure, they are actually providing uh, free use of up to 50 gigabytes per data set. So if you upload a new data set, or in this case, a model, um, you can put in information up to 50 gigs, which for them is small potatoes um, compared with the petabytes that they need for, for the LHC. Um, and this is all built on good faith and is provided on uh, as a public service. Um, importantly, they have very, very good data safeguards, um, which means that you can put your stuff up there and, and be fairly well assured that it will be there in perpetuity. Um, and it's also really easy to use. All you need to sign up is an email address. Uh, you can link it with a Git profile or your ORCID. Um, so just to walk through this really quick, say you've already signed up using one of those resources, uh, you start a new upload, um, and this will allow you to create a new repository. Um, so this should all look really familiar to people. It's a drag and drop interface, very much like what you would use on something like Google Drive. Um, and you put in all of the items that you need to run your model, uh, or rather if someone were to download this repository um, to be able to run your model. So for inclusion in the FathomNet model zoo, we require a few uh, very basic things. First is model parameters or weights. Um, this is what you need to load and run the model that you trained. Um, so this particular model that we're showing here was trained using PyTorch. So the models are serialized in a .pt or .pth files. Um, you need to include a training and validation list that contain image paths and annotations used to train and evaluate the model. Um, so these will ideally be lists of URLs or UUIDs that point to the images as they are indexed in FathomNet. Um, and this will make it easier for others to reproduce your results and possibly use it for their, their own purposes. Um, ideally, there will also be some sort of indication of how the model performs. Uh, in the case of this particular one that I'm demonstrating here, we included a confusion matrix. Uh, it can really just be any sort of performance metrics that allow someone uh, very quickly to get a sense of how well the model works in the particular environment 
that it was trained for. Uh, it's really just something so that a user can confirm that they are replicating the output of your system if they attempt to use it for themselves. Um, there's other metadata that you uh, will be asked to enter. They require a few things, um, uh, but very, very lightweight. Uh, so you need to put in a publication date, come up with a title, list out the authors that are associated with it, and give a description. Um, so in the description, uh, you should include um, things like the software you used, the specific architecture, any training details that people might need. Um, so try to write up everything such that somebody else that might try to grab this could run the model and understand how to, how to make that happen and what sort of performance they can expect. Um, there are loads of other things that you might consider adding in a repository like this. In this particular example, we also included a dictionary specifying how we merged some layers to create super categories. And we also included a few Python notebooks that demonstrate how to use the model if you were to download it from Zenodo. Um, and then finally, you need to specify a license. Uh, and there are loads of options here. Um, and be aware that you can restrict access until a publication comes out and then fully open source it in a later version. Um, we recommend using some sort of CCA license. There are lots of legal details here. It's well worth familiarizing yourself with the ins and outs um, because it, it has some effect on, on how people can use this stuff. Um, and then there are a huge number of other fields in here that you can fill out as you wish. Um, and finally, if you're uploading a model that you trained using FathomNet data, uh, we would uh, ideally like people to use our FathomNet Zenodo community. Um, it's just a, uh, a field in the upload interface that you start typing in FathomNet, and up will pop a uh, selection that you can click to link your model to our community. Um, so uh, finally, once all your files are staged, um, you can upload to Zenodo. And a word of caution, once you upload to this resource, you will not be able to remove them. It's meant to be an archive of, um, of your work. Um, so you can version it. So if you decide you need to change something in the model uh, or you want to post an update, uh, you can do that by, by updating it. But you can't remove something once it is up there. Um, once you click Go, uh, we, the FathomNet um, group, will be updated, and we can go through and check to make sure all of the stuff in there that we hope people add is in the repository, and go ahead and link it to the community. Um, and all of this will plug back into the GitHub model zoo. Um, so you can then uh, take the information that you put onto the Zenodo page and um, share it via that DOI. So the way that we're requesting that people do that is to edit the readme in GitHub using the in-browser interface edit interface. Um, so you just click that little pencil there, and it takes you to a, um, uh, a markdown document that you can then edit and add a line in the table. Um, if you're unfamiliar with markdown syntax, there's a handy link at the bottom of the page uh, that will help you out. So once you finish adding your line to the table, um, you can go in and create a new branch for this commit and start a pull request. So I just labeled mine with my username and new model for FathomNet. Uh, add some details in there about the commit that you're doing. Uh, and then once you click Propose Changes, it'll submit what's called a pull request. Uh, and so that will let you say that you added a new model to the GitHub Model Zoo. Um, you can say a little bit about what it is, and you can suggest one of us to review it. And then we will review it um, and add it to the table for everyone else to be able to see and access via the GitHub landing page. Um, so with that, I'll thank you all for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Eric. Um, we've got a question from Tushar. How long does it usually take on average for a pull request submitted to be accepted? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, we've only had, aside from models that we've submitted internally, one other model that's been uploaded thus far. And the turnaround for that was very quick because we were all real excited. Um, and we're hoping to keep that enthusiasm high. Um, 
we're we're pretty active on on GitHub. So if you submit um, a PR, we should see it very quickly and and have feedback in short order. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, a question about Embari's own data and why only a subset of it um, is used for this example. I'm not a hundred percent sure what the question is asking, but it looks like Brian does. Go for I it. Do. Uh, and if you look at our data sets that are submitted in the Darwin core, it'll say this is a subset of Embari's data. <clears throat> uh, we're not sharing all of our data. We have some institutional embargoes in place. Usually it's if a researcher is doing some um, say working on a publication or, to, or writing up a new species, we don't want to share that data out with the world. So we, we don't provide it. We also have a standard embargo of two years. So um, any data that's more recent than two years, we, we, we heat close to give our researchers a uh, first chance to look at the data and produce publications on it. Thanks, Brian. Um, Elva has a question about um, submitting. Is it better to review before submitting this uh, the models in case there is an error? Since you said that it was, you know, you can't ever delete it. So yeah, what is a good workflow? <laughs> um, so uh, Elva, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think that Katie's interpretation mm -hmm. is is the same one that I have that you're talking about the the Zenodo submission. Um, I think that. I mean, what, if you can establish that you can run your model and get reasonable results, that's probably good enough. Um, and I'm sure that that we would be happy to to take a peek at potential submissions if you're if you're concerned about it. Um, certainly, with the the model that I was just referring to that got uploaded to the model zoo, I iterated a little bit with the researchers that actually did the training to to make sure that they had everything that they needed in there. Um, it sounds sort of big big and scary, um, but it's it's actually not not too uh, heavy of a lift. Um, and again, if you if you choose if you upload it and there's a mistake, then you can just submit a new version that corrects that mistake. No harm, no foul. Thanks. So um, next question is about the uh, sort of trade-offs between creating our own model zoo or model aquarium um, versus using a broader site a place like hugging face that could enable a broader community to um to to engage and use use these tools yeah we've definitely talked about that um we've looked at doing something like hugging face or google cards to to index our models a bit more robustly um i think that eventually what we might end up doing is plugging in with a resource like that but sort of maintaining our own list uh, as a another place that people can go and look for that information, um, there's a you know a slight danger in things getting lost in something like Hugging Face, and especially if the goal is to try to enable marine scientists to be able to use these things, that it's a resource that they might not know to look for. Um, so it's uh, something that's definitely on our on our radar, uh, and there's a lot of value to cross indexing between the two. Um, but in in short, we we haven't done that yet, but it's it's definitely something that has been part of our internal discussions. Great. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, everybody, for the questions. So we are going to wrap it up the next half hour. We will um, turn it back over to Kakani to talk about the FathomNet community. Great. Let me see. Da, da, da. All right, so hopefully you all are seeing what I'm saying. Um, all right, so we're very excited about what we're trying to build here. And of course, we're only going to be successful with uh, community input. And I wanted to talk about what this all means. Um, and again, just a reminder, and you're going to see this slide a lot, right? FathomNet is in beta. And really what our goals here today is to share you know, the, the visions and the goals that we have for FathomNet, uh, build community, you know, engage with, with you all. Uh, but then I think really importantly, we want to generate feedback uh, to improve, right, uh, the features that we've already put out there and with the goal of implementing this in, in this year, actually. Uh, and so I'll talk about that a little bit more detail tomorrow. Um, but just, you know, overall, this is, this is what we're trying to do um, as part of the workshop. 
And, you know, because I'm an engineer, I don't necessarily know how to build community. Uh, but fortunately, there are researchers and scientists out there where, you know, they they think about this a lot, like, um, you know, social psychology, but behind community building. And there is a paper published in 1986, a while ago, I realized, but um, that has identified, you know, four key factors that define a sense of community. Uh, you know, the first is membership, so um, providing a, a mechanism for creating a sense of belonging and identification, uh, and also alignment with other community members that have uh, similar goals and, and interests. Um, also influence, so it's important that members of this community um, are empowered to uh, provide feedback, uh, have influence, right, over what the group is doing. And, you know, that that group cohesiveness really depends on whether or not um, group members feel like they have influence. Um, and so, that, again, is a big reason for why we want, you know, your feedback. We've created a number of mechanisms to 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 gather that feedback uh, so that we can ensure that we're, we're building something that that uh, addresses the community needs. Uh, and then integration and fulfillment of needs, right? It's one thing to, to provide, uh, you know, feedback, but it's another thing to actually deliver on them. And so that's a, a big part of what we're trying to do um, as, as part of these workshops is, is giving you updates on where we are. Uh, and then finally, shared emotional connection. I think we, most of us here, most of us here can agree that, you know, obviously we care about the ocean and we want to contribute in some way. Um, and so it's these quality interactions and bonds that we have, uh, we know, within this project or within this, this, this scope of work um, that are created. Um, and then also receiving credit from within the community, right? The idea that we need to provide mechanisms for attribution um, so that, you know, it's, people know how you've contributed and how you've actually helped push uh, FathomNet forward. Um, and so uh, a couple of things I want to highlight, uh, this is the, you know, the, the, the first, the, the landing page, if you select about us, you will see a lot of content and information. Um, I wanted to, uh, you know, just quickly show you there's terms of use, there's quick external links, and then a, a quick summary in terms of what, um, you know, how this was started. Uh, and then, of course, uh, a lot of acknowledgments, right? A lot of we're, we're building something on top of uh, tools and services that other, pe other people have built. And so it's important that we make that clear. Uh, and so there's several ways that you can get involved. Um, you know, there's a, a mailing list that you can sign up for by going to uh, FathomNet's blog on Medium. So medium.com slash FathomNet. Uh, of course, if you can upload your annotated images uh, to FathomNet, that would be fantastic. Um, you know, providing verification of images or labels in FathomNet co that correspond to your subject matter expertise. And I'll be talking a little bit more about some of the improvements we um, are in the process of implementing that can help facilitate those kinds of interactions. Uh, and then, you know, Eric and Kevin did a fantastic job talking about uh, GitHub and how it's not only a place for, you know, accessing code, but also the models that uh, people are training using uh, FathomNet data. Um, and again, uh, one, one thing I do want to highlight that we haven't talked too much about is uh, community feedback. So again, it's important for us to get your feedback, um, but also, you know, respond to it and uh, ensure that that feedback is incorporated into like the next versions or the, the next um, you know, implementation of, of FathomNet. So if you select community feedback, there's two things I wanna highlight. There's issues and discussions. Uh, issues is really you know, a place where you can tell us specifically, okay, there's something maybe not working with the database or something specific that you would like to see, like a feature incorporated. Um, and so it's here that we, you know, uh, evaluate them. Um, we also comment on them, assign issues to different people. And so you're welcome to take a look at the issues. I think now we're up to what, probably on the order of 90. Um, and so the idea is that this is a, a way for you to keep track of our progress as well. Uh, if to make a new issue, you just uh, hit that new issue green button. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight is discussion. So this is a situation where, you know, you're not really sure what you want, or, but what you think would be really helpful, but you would love to like start bouncing ideas off of 
team members, like the core Fathomit team members. Um, and, you know, we're happy to do that. Um, so like, for instance, Dan here had this idea about a mentorship system. So maybe the, a mechanism for us to engage more enthusiasts or, you know, people who may not be programmers yet or familiar with um, marine science um, applications. You know, these are these are active conversations that we would love to, to have with, with the community. And again, uh, uh, hit that green button for new discussions. Um, and so besides GitHub, we you can also help by creating uh, how-to videos or workflows and share them on, you know, either Fathomet's blog at medium.com or on YouTube. So, you know, similarly, we saw how the Sea Vision group with Ben's, Ben Woodward's group, you know, they've created a blog as well as a YouTube, um, a YouTube video describing Tater. So we're happy to, to do the same thing for any other annotation tool, particularly if you know we've figured out ways to incorporate Fathomit um, uh, data into the process. So if you were to go to our medium, uh, you'll see a number of articles that have been uploaded. You know, the very first one was uh, written by Brian, how to submit localized image annotations to Fathomnet. So this does a really good job of walking you through the process um, and, you know, on how to fathom it or how to, um, how to format the data that then winds up um, being contributed to Fathomnet. Kevin has a really great explainer on, you know, how do you use the, the Python API for Fathomnet. Uh, Eric talks about how to upload your ML models to Fathomnet. So if, you know, the presentation isn't enough, there's more content in, in these blog posts. So feel free to take a look. And then finally, um, John uh, at Sea Vision also described how they're staging data on Tater for it to wind up being submitted to Fathomnet. Um, and then uh, YouTube channels, this is important. Here you'll also find not only um, helpful demos, uh, you'll also find content that we posted last year as part of the Fathomnet workshop. Um, so like, for instance, when I had more time and on my hands, I used to make video demos describing different uh, tools that we have in Ambari. So like the Deep Sea Guide, the VARS Query Tool, um, you know, there's also that video demo for uh, Tater. And so feel free to take a look at the, that content. There, we're constantly adding more and more content. And again, if you have your own content you want to contribute, just reach out and let us know. Um, and then what's next? All right. So then really, really important, right, is, is terms of use. I've spent a ton of time with uh, lawyers, IP lawyers, to going over this um, to try and come up with a data use policy that would address the needs and the, the concerns of a lot of different institutions, right? Um, you know, starting with Ambari National Geographic Society and of course, NOAA and, and other people. And so um, the idea is that this, this data use policy really is a compromise that addresses concerns uh, across a lot of individuals. Um, so first, you know, the annotations in the data set are made available in accordance with this terms of use. The, the annotations are licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 4.0 International License. The images, though, have a slightly different license. They're they're attributed. Uh, they're licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. But we do make them available with the exception or for the exception uh, that people can use them for training and development of machine learning algorithms. And that can be for commercial, academic, or government purposes. So, um, you know, limited use, but we provide that exception just for uh, development and training of machine learning algorithms. But again, because people are providing this image data, you can potentially use that image data for a number of other applications. But if you choose to do that, you need to reach out to the, to the original copyright holder or owner of that imagery before you do that. And so the way we built Fathomet, it was we, we made sure that, you know, it's very, very easy to get that information so that you can contact the copyright holder of the image um, to, to then get permission uh, for your particular use. Uh, finally, uh, we have a disclaimer. Um, US is particularly litigious, but I wanted to say that, you know, just so you know, images and annotations are provided uh, by the copyright holders and contributors as is. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, and then other things, right? Of course, we expect people to follow the, the data use policy. Please read that, get familiar with it. Um, but we also request that users agree to the following terms. 
Uh, so for instance, acknowledgements, of course, we would love, um, you know, fathom that to be acknowledged uh, in, in your publications or your projects. So, you know, please, uh, you know, cite our uh, recent publication. Uh, this uh, publication uh, came out uh, late last year, oh, September of 2022. Uh, it's also generated a lot of engagement, like we're in the 99th percentile based on alt metrics. Um, so, but please, please just continue citing this. I mean, we're going to be nowhere near an image net um, the citation list, but still, uh, we do appreciate that. Uh, and also, if you're sharing your work, uh, either by a presentation or a poster, please slap on a FathomNet logo on your materials. Um, we actually make the, the, the logo really easy to find. Uh, you can actually find it on our GitHub at the FathomNet logo repo. repo. Um, and there you can download all sorts of flavors of the logo uh, if, that you want. And, you know, please, please do that because I think, you know, it's important for people to, to see FathomNet, know it exists and start to recognize, um, you know, that, that, that contribution and, and help us grow over time. Uh, the second thing is enrichments. Uh, so the idea, right, is if we're creating a database, we're trying to create a community you know, it, it, it's not just using that um, resource, but also figuring out ways to contribute back based on your, you know, area of expertise or your interests. So, you know, for example, you could create how-to videos or workflows that you then post to Fathomet's Medium or YouTube channels. Uh, you know, Eric spent a lot of time talking about how you can, um, you know, post your models on the Fathomet Model Zoo using uh, GitHub. Uh, you can, of course, contribute uh, label data um, or provide your subject matter expertise to validate submitted data for, again, the purpose of growing this ecosystem, helping it, you know, maintain and continue um, being really healthy. Uh, and then finally, benevolent use. I think Brian also mentioned this, but really we want the data to be used only in ways that are consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And again, if you haven't taken a look at that, there's 17 of them. Um, and so, you know, get familiar with, with that as well. So we've also created a lot of different ways to connect with us. Um, we're, we're very easy to find. <laughs> so firstly, we have a Twitter. Uh, so uh, follow us at twitter.com slash fathomnet. Uh, I wanted to also highlight that Kevin has done some great work with a, a Twitter bot um, called fathomnet bot, which is just kind of fun. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Uh, we also have a Slack space. So the idea that, you know, if you have questions, uh, if you want to, you know, tag any of the, the team here and want to have some back and forth, you know, or, you know, you've come across new data sets or you've come across new papers that, you know, we as a community should be aware of, please post them. So join us on Slack. Uh, and then also if, uh, you know, if, if Discord is more of your, your flavor of interaction, um, we've been, you know, working really closely with the live stream oceanographic community. Uh, in fact, they will be presenting to the enthusiast breakouts uh, tomorrow, but you can join their Discord channel and there is, um, or their Discord server and that there is a FathomNet channel um, specifically where, you know, we, we check and, and interact with, uh, with people there. I also kind of get information, release new content and stuff on there just to get uh, feedback too. Um, so that's a fun space. And besides that, you know, we've got an email, fathomnetanabari.org. Those emails get sent to Kevin now. Uh, they used to be sent to me. So that's fantastic. Uh, there's obviously the website, fathomnet.org, the GitHub, github.com slash fathomnet, the blog, medium.com slash fathomnet, YouTube, we have a, a fancy um, a custom URL now, youtube.com slash C slash Fathomnet, and the Slack space, the Discord, and the list goes on. All of these links are in the agenda, so do, do not worry about taking any of these notes down. And really, we're just curious how we're doing. We are just here trying to collect feedback and uh, connect with you all. So that's it. Wow, look at that, done early. Great job.